Um, we're now in public session as we have a quorum I call the meeting to order. Apologies have been received this morning from Deputy Maureen O'Sullivan and Deputy Catherine Byrne and Deputy uh, Brazil is substituting for Deputy Barry Cowan. Uh, colleagues, once again in relation to the mobile phones, uh, either switch them off or to flight mode or any other devices with 3G or 4G connectivity. Uh, it affects not just the meeting but the broadcast and the recording of it. In accordance with the standard proce procedures agreed by the Committee on Procedures and Privileges for paperless committees, all documentation for the meeting has been circulated to members on the document database. I propose that we go to private session to deal with correspondence and certain other matters. Is that agreed? agreed. Uh, as we're now in public session, I wish to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of Section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. However, if you're directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to so do, you're entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You're directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you're asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise nor make charges against any person, persons or entity by name, or in such a way as to make him, her or it identifiable. The opening statement you've submitted to the committee will be published on the committee website after the meeting. And members are reminded of the long-standing practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the House or an official, either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. And to the witnesses and colleagues once again reminding you either please turn the mobile phones off or to flight mode. And I'd like to welcome the Irish Refugee Council who are here today, represented by Sue Conlon and Rory O'Neill. You're both very welcome and thank you very much for coming. As I say, we have your opening st uh, statement, but uh, if you'd like to make a statement or a summary, and then <coughs> I'll ask colleagues to uh, have a number of questions for you. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, thank you very much, Chair, for the opportunity to come before the committee today and to address issues regarding the reception and housing of asylum seekers and refugees, uh, apologies for the very late submission of the, uh, of the documents, which you may not have had the time to read in full. I'm, of course, I'm not going to repeat what's in the document um, and would welcome any questions arising. I want actually to draw attention to a few of those things. And the way that myself and Rory are doing this is that I'm going to speak about the initial reception uh, of asylum seekers and refugees, and then he will deal with the issues relating to the transition of people once they get their papers or those who are moving from the initial reception centres for refugees. So that's how we're dividing it up. I want, first of all, to start uh, with a story because I think it helps to illustrate the reality of what it is that we're talking about. Uh, two days ago, I spent a couple of hours with a young man in his late 20s from a country which is well known in the news at the moment for giving rise to refugees. I spent time with him because he was down in Dublin for an interview in connection with his asylum claim that was taking place the day after. And he'd come down the day before because he wouldn't otherwise have been able to make it in time for a nine o'clock uh, interview. And I spent time with him, it's the second time I've met him. And he just was talking with me, showing me photographs of his home uh, people that he went to university with, his wife, their daughter, and of course we talked about what had led him to leave, it was all of his own volition, and his hopes that he will eventually be able to get his papers here, he's been here a relatively short period of time, and bring his wife and his daughter to join him because he's very much feeling isolated. And the emphasis of his point that he was making to me or that came across was that he hopes, of course, to get his refugee status and to get it quite soon and then to be able to bring his wife and daughter. But the problem will be that he's in a direct provision centre. They will not be able to live with him in that centre. And he's already well aware, he studied English literature at university, well aware of the housing situation here, wondering how long it will be before he's able to get accommodation that would facilitate him being reunited with his wife and daughter. And that's one of the reasons why this housing situation is so key to people who are expected to get refugee status and to make Ireland their home. 
But there's another factor I just want to mention in relation to him. And that is that um, I met him again the day after. I took him to the direct provision centre in Dublin that he was staying with uh, the night before, uh, accommodation having been arranged for him. Uh, and I asked him, you know, how did he get on? He said, well, I didn't sleep. I was put into a room with two people, of course, I'd never met before, who were from different countries, who'd already been living there for a while, and the accommodation just didn't suit him that well. He had a roof over his head, he had a bed to sleep on. But this was before probably the most important interview that he was due to have. And I think the thing that we forget about direct provision and the accommodation of asylum seekers is that accommodation is part of a very important process. And unless you're accommodated in a place that enables you to engage properly with that process, a wrong decision can be made. I met two weeks ago with someone who, after eight years, has finally had a decision on his refugee appeal. And that's the first of three applications in this, uh, in this country. There's one other uh, thing I want to touch on, and this is already on the public record. There's a, a group at a mosque in Dublin, uh, the Dublin Islamic Foundation of Ireland, that requested access to refugees, Muslim refugees, in an emergency reception and orientation centre in Monaster Evin, in County Tipperary. Uh, the reply on rec records to that from the Minister for Justice, Francis Fitzgerald, uh, given on the 17th of May, um, indicates the restrictions um, that they put in place for the, for the purposes of pr protection of privacy. But there's a statement in that uh, reply which is fundamentally wrong, and I want to read that statement. It says, it is required under law to protect the identity of refugees. That is not true. Section 19 of the Refugee Act 1996, which is still in force, Section 26 of the International Potential Act 2015, due to come into force in July, refer to protecting the identity of applicants under the Act. And the 2015 Act refers in addition to those who have been applicants under the Act. Refugees being transferred from Jordan to Lebanon have never applied under any Act in this country. They are being brought in, already recognised as refugees. And therefore, we've got a situation in relation to the newer refugees who are coming to these emergency reception and orientation centres who are wrongly being denied the opportunity for greater integration with local communities. And the reason the mosque sought um, an approach was because Ramadan is coming up and they want to help facilitate those people having access um, to wider Muslim groups. So I just wanted to put those two things on record. But let me now come to the issues. A anything that we say is already in full knowledge of the difficulties that are being faced by people already in the country um, who are seeking housing or have been made homeless. And I think one of the things that the homelessness situation has drawn attention to is the fact that others such as teachers are beginning to speak out about the impact quite soon on children of being in hotels of not having the privacy and the space that they need. And yet this is the, if you put that, wrote that situation large, this is the situation that asylum seekers have been facing for many, many years. And as we say in the very first line, being a refugee is the most extreme form of loss of home and displacement. It is the ultimate in homelessness. And you're in a country which you do not know, separated uh, from family uh, who themselves may be spread in many other countries. And what we have in Ireland is a two-tier two, uh, two system has developed since last September. And I think there's a danger in that. Um, we're beginning to see people fleeing war as the real refugees and the others who come for other reasons, or from countries that are not so prominently in the news, such as South Sudan and Burundi, as perhaps not being as, as entitled to protection as refugees. And that is wrong in itself, because refugee status can arise, for example, because of sexual orientation. But because we've, we, we're focusing on what the EU is doing, and an emphasis, of course, upon Syria for very obvious reasons, given the numbers that are now fleeing that country and have fled, um, we have two systems. We have a direct provision system for people who come of their own volition and claim asylum. 
And we have the emergency reception and orientation centres and further resettlement for those that are being brought into the country, either from Jordan and Lebanon as recognised refugees, or relocated from Greece and Italy. Ireland made a commitment to take about 4,000, either by way of resettlement or relocation. Uh, so far, a family of 10 have come from Greece, but more are in the pipeline to be relocated from, relocated from Greece and Italy. And the difference, therefore, is quite stark between those in direct provision and those in the emergency reception and orientation centres. And I'll touch on that a little when it comes to that. The direct provision centres are overseen by the Reception and Integration Agency, which is part of the Department of Justice. And paragraph 2.3 on page 2, uh, we quote from the RIA website uh, where they say, RIA seeks to ensure that the material needs of residents in the period during which their applications for international are being processed are met. And we do add... Uh, in all uh, integrity to RIA that they continue to accommodate people post-protection application and even those who have a deportation order who have not been removed from the country um, and therefore reducing to some degree homelessness. But what we're therefore talking about when we talk about accommodation of, of, of asylum seekers, people awaiting a decision on a claim, is that material needs of residents. But as I've already indicated in the story at the beginning, it's not just material needs that need to be met. It's not just a question of a roof over your head and food in your belly. I actually spoke with a young man. I asked him about the, the food in the accommodation centre where he is. He goes for one of the three meals a day. And he joked, he's already, he knows a bit about Ireland. He said, sometimes I just eat potato. He says, I'm already integrating well into Ireland uh, because I've learnt a taste for potatoes. But often the food, he doesn't like it because, of course, one of the fundamental things about this system, it, as we say in this document, <clears throat> In paragraph 2.7, and this applies to direct provision centres and emergency reception orientation centres, they share characteristics with each other and also common with people who are in homelessness accommodation. Lack of autonomy, control, privacy, security, the ability to engage properly with friends or people from the community. And one of the things that has happened, uh, and I draw attention in this to the statistics which appear in paragraph 2.2, and I'm grateful to Ria for providing with up-to-date up statistics up to March because they're not yet available publicly because of a loss of a staff member. But you'll see there more than 600 people have been in direct provision for more than eight years. That's 13.4%. In hotels, in chalets, in mobile homes. Um, over 1,500. That's a third of the current uh, population as at March have been in direct provision for three years. Average length of stay in direct provision centres is 38 months. And therefore the impact of that when we come to people moving on is significant and, and my colleague Rawley will address that. But one of the things that's fallen off, and this comes to the first recommendation we make, you'll see at the end of paragraph 2.4 the post of Minister for Integration has not existed since the last government came into power in March 2011. There is no integration, no plans for the integration of asylum seekers. And yet these are people, many of them, whatever status they get, will be remaining in Ireland. And to a degree we're building up problems for the future. Because we're then not providing them the support that they need to move on, um, whatever length of time that they have spent in the system. The title Reception and Integration Agency, RIA, is therefore misleading because the word integration has not existed as part of their remit since 2007. And we're nearly 10 years on from that and no one is addressing the integration of asylum seekers. But in addition, the Minister for Justice, you'll see from paragraph 2.5, in March 2014, and therefore more than two years ago, announced that there be a review of the appro island's approach to the integration of migrants. We are yet to see the publication of that integration policy. Now, to be fair to those who were, uh, came together interdepartmentally to look at that, they did uh, take submissions in relation to the integration of asylum seekers. So that may yet to come. But at the moment, that has not happened, uh, and therefore um, we haven't seen whether or not there is an attempt to integrate a significant population with very, very varied needs 
um, in the country. To come briefly to emergency reception orientation centres, of which there are two at the moment, one in Monastrevin in County Tipperary, owned by direct provision uh, centre owners, and another one in Dungarvan in County Waterford, uh, owned by a company that had not previously been involved with asylum seekers and refugees. Uh, and they are uh, emergency centres, uh, reception uh, uh, or orientation takes place over a period of eight to ten weeks before they should be moved on to more permanent accommodation. A group is about to go to Kerry. Mayo County Council has announced that a group is going to be going to Mayo. We know that there are plans to move some to Limerick. Some have gone to Mallow in County Cork, and some. the exception with that group is that there was no real provision of support for that group, and therefore you'll have heard more about their stories in the news, because eventually when they linked up with local people, some of the information came out about the process uh, and, and the way in which they were beginning to adapt to life in Mallow. And one of the unfortunate things, and I, it was reflected in the answer to that parliamentary questions, is why the Office for the Promotion of Migrant Integration, which is the group, the, the unit that oversees resettled refugees and the relocation of asylum seekers from Greece and Italy, whilst uh, their title is clearly promotion of integration, Unfortunately, they have taken secrecy and privacy to a, to a new level to the extent that it's exceptionally difficult for people to, who want to get, engage with those new communities and, and enable them to begin to learn what life in Ireland is like. Access is restricted. Um, I made a, an application which is being considered for the IRC to join with a very large company in Ireland during its charity month to spend some time just one day or part of a day in, a, in one of these two centres and I've been informed that the request has gone to the principal officer at the Office for the Promotion of Migrant Integration. That really isn't something that needs to be on the table on the, uh, to be dealt with by a principal officer. This is something that can be dealt with if people are properly trained in these centres. Of course you want to protect and you don't want people going in who are going to abuse and attack them, but people who are offering a welcome as we've seen in other countries, shouldn't be um, set back and, and unable to offer the support that's needed, particularly companies that are doing it, or including companies that are doing it as part of their um, uh, corporate social responsibility. I'm briefly just going to come to the recommendations on page four. <coughs> We've actually made a recommendation that Reception Integration Agency and the Office for the Promotion of Migrant Integration, at least as it concerns the resettlement of refugees, um, be taken from the Department of Justice and Equality and put into the new Department of Housing, Planning and Local Government. I'm maybe wrong, but I'm kind of assuming that everyone else who's made submissions to you or is due to come before you is probably having their housing needs dealt with by this new department. Why would you therefore separate this particular group of people under the Department of Justice? I don't, I don't know if the Taoiseach has yet made announcements about the new junior ministries. I know that one of them was due to be around housing, but clearly that this is a, a prime issue, hence the existence of this committee, and therefore why not move responsibility for the housing of asylum seekers and refugees under that department, particularly as it includes local government, and local government is key to the integration of these refugees who are being resettled around the country. So that's the first recommendation. The second one is relating to the integration strategy that's been in the pipeline since March 2014. It would be good to see a commitment to see that published and of course to include um, asylum seekers within that. But also our recommendation is to phase out direct provision on the lines that we previously proposed and we've done a link and you'll only be able to see this in the electronic version to uh, a second of proposals that we put forward. The first was in 2011 as to what reception of asylum seekers should be. This was December 2013, the one that's before you there, as to what an alternative reception system should, should be for asylum seekers. And that document is quite, addresses quite a number of uh, points, and I'll leave that for your attention. But finally, a recommendation that companies and organisations that receive public funding should be required to operate transparently to enable proper accountability. And the reason for that is that of the companies, and this is paragraph 2.1 on page 2, about the 35 centres across 16 counties, 
The largest of these companies with the capacity to accommodate more than a third of direct provision resi residents are registered as unlimited rather than as limited liability and therefore they do not have to file publicly accessible returns with the company registration office. Now of course if it's a private business they're entitled to some degree of privacy but huge amounts of public money are being put into direct provision. On average, for a family of four, we've calculated it's about €48,000 a year that would be provi provided to accommodate and support in one of these direct provision centres, 48000 How much of that could be used for that person to be living in a community or at least give them greater autonomy and control by being in units where they're able to cook? I would have thought that it was a basic principle that public money should only be going to companies where there is some ability to see how that money is using that and how much of it is going for the benefit of the people they are accommodating. And therefore that is a further recommendation that we make. Um, I take more time than I wanted to, but if there is time, Rory will briefly address. Before we go to Rory, if the colleagues have any specific questions, we can come to Rory as we go through the so if there's any colleagues at this stage who uh, would like to deputy O'Brien? I'd prefer to hear Rory before, if you don't mind, just I think it would yeah. make more sense. Okay, Rory. Thank you for the opportunity to talk here this morning. Uh, currently there are over 500 people stuck in the direct provision system who have their papers and are entitled to leave. This is obviously because of the national housing crisis, but there are steps that could be taken to help them move on. The transition from a long-term shared institutional existence in direct provision to living autonomously in the community is seen as another precarious journey in the lives of asylum seekers and refugees. After years of enduring an institutional existence, the relief of receiving a positive status and being able to move on is short-lived. The realisation that people now have to fend for themselves after year years of living a life that allows for no determination, freedom or independence is a daunting and problematic position for people making this transition. Why we support and welcome the recommendations that others have made to this committee in regard to rent control, caps on rent, the increase in capital spending on social housing and increase in rent allowances and rent certainty among others. We see that the issues of housing and homelessness as one that affects many other groups of people. We are here to acknowledge and illustrate the problems that face the migrant community and those that have been through the asylum process are now entitled to avail of the social entitlements that are applicable to their particular situation and individual requirements. This new community of people have particular and exigent needs that they are struggling to meet and deal with. Without the basic needs of suitable housing, this cohort of people will struggle to become productive and contributing members of society and remain disenfranchised, which will further contribute to social injustice and inequality. <coughs> Even without suffering from the residual effects of institutional living, transition from DP is fraught with difficulty. The catch-22 situation exists for most people whereby when they try to access social welfare they are unable to do so because they do not have an address. To get an address they have to be out of the uh, DP system so they are caught up in a vicious cycle where they cannot access social welfare to get housing unless they can get out of the hostels. Some people are able to access social welfare while they are in the DP centres thus allowing them the ability to save for deposit while in the main this is not the case. It should be remembered that people in the asylum system are not allowed to work, a prohibition, a prohibition that is maintained in the International Protection Act 2015 and receive an allowance of 1910 a week which has enabled them to actually save for a deposit. In many cases landlords do not accept rent allowance um, even, though this is not the, even though this is the law and it can no longer discriminate but this is a common problem for people coming out. They are not able to get references to access accommodation. The difficulty in sourcing accommodation that allows people to live close to family, friends and schools and support networks is extremely difficult. As you are well aware, the rental market for accommodation is in extreme short supply and this is further compounded by the fact that landlords will not accept rent loans. Rules that, forbid, for, rules that forbid for asylum seekers from working and attending college further exacerbated the isolation and social exclusion that this living in direct provision involves. And the, precludes them from moving on properly when they do get their papers. Thank you. Thank you, Mr O'Neill. Uh, okay, colleagues, who would, who would like to start? Deputy O'Brien. Uh, thanks, Chair, and, and thanks, Sue and, and Rory, for the, for the presentations. 
Um, it, like a number of the TDs here, I represent a constituency that has a very significant uh, asylum and direct provision uh, uh, community uh, in Clondalkin. Uh, so we would work quite a lot with uh, the residents of the towers, both while they're stuck in the asylum system and uh, the 40 or so families that are there at the minute who have got their papers and, and have yet to be housed. A lot of your recommendations I, I fully support, but they're really beyond the scope of the very limited role that this uh, committee has, uh, although I think some of them are things that we we'll probably return to when the Oireachtas Housing Committee is established. But I, I have specific questions. We have to make a report to the, to the Dáil and ultimately to the Minister in a couple of weeks' time that's kind of, try, I suppose, trying to look at immediate interventions that could be made now to alleviate the kind of the worst end of the housing and homeless crisis, including for the, the group of, of people that we're talking about today. Uh, and there's a particular set of difficulties, which I know you know more about than I do, but just to put them on the record, when somebody gets their papers, even after six or eight years in the direct provision system, the, the difficulties, the specific difficulties that they then have in terms of even getting onto social housing waiting lists, let alone getting access to housing, is far more burdensome than uh, non-asylum seekers. There's huge language barriers. Uh, the waiting times in most of the big urban local authorities to get your housing needs assessment is now four months. Uh, so even before you have a formal decision on it. Um, and navigating that system is incredibly complex. Um, the social welfare issue is also very complex because I know many cases of, of people who've got their papers in towers. They have been awarded job seekers allowance while still resident in towers, but they're getting the reduced rate job seekers allowance, which is the same level as they were getting under the direct provision payment, um, which is a slightly different description of the same reality than you described. So my question is, what measure or measures could be put in place, I presume via the local authorities, immediately to try and assist that transition process that would meet the specific needs of the kind of post-asylum process individuals we're talking about? Because um, I think if we were able to fix that bit or make a recommendation to the, to the Dáil and to the Minister, even on that bit alone, a very good, strong recommendation, that would, I think, in and of itself have a, a huge help. And then secondly, in terms of accessing accommodation, because even when you get on the lists, in most of the Dublin local authorities, it's a 10-year wait, um, irrespective of the household size. In terms of accessing private rental accommodation with state supports through HAP or whatever, do you have any specific recommendations in terms of how to overcome the particular barriers that post-asylum application individuals are currently experiencing? Again, just with the recommendations we have to make to the, to the Dáil and the Minister in mind. Thank you, Deputy O'Brien. I'll take one other question at this stage as well. Deputy uh, Ryan. Thanks very much, Chair. I want to thank you very much for coming in. It was very uh, useful insight. Uh, and I think the real examples you use in terms of your presentation is very helpful. Uh, in terms of your recommendations, uh, in, um, in terms of housing and the housing needs of the groups that you represent, the reason you're here today is because this group decided that you know, this is an area that we need to address. Uh, so you've got um, allies in here. So in terms of the, your initial recommendation, and I agree with uh, uh, Deputy O'Brien in terms of we have limited scope in terms of what we can do, but in terms of your first recommendation, it would seem to me that uh, any recommendation from us to say that the RIA, etc., should move to the Department of the Environment might land, just basically it might land on deaf ears. So it might be a difficult uh, objective to achieve. But certainly I would like to see the situation you know, pertaining to the housing needs of the group certainly coming within that scope. So I would ask if you could think again about that particular recommendation and whether or not you could have a fresh look at it and structure it differently. Uh, in order that we could go off and recommend some element of the housing needs to, to the Minister to address your concerns on the housing element of it. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Ryan. At this stage, is there anybody else? Deputy Wallace. Oh, on, on the same point, um, um, I accept uh, your point that it, it would be very difficult uh, to actually get that, but I think it would be worth trying. I, I think that the Minister for Justice is... is uh, not really uh, the right place for that, um, and uh, I mean, I have, I, have, um, I have serious reservations to how the Minister of Justice is handling anything to do with refugees, um, but definitely in this area here, um, I think it's something that we should support uh, moving it into the new department for certain. 
I just uh, as, as you're answering those, I, I suppose Deputy O'Brien really hit the nail on the head. This committee was established before the government with, with a remit to report by the 17th of June. And while you have spoken on a range of issues, the focus of this committee, and it's not that we're not conscious of, but our reporting is around the housing issue in particular. Um, so I suppose the recommendations and the issues that you highlight directly in that area is of paramount concern to the committee. Uh, not uh, being disrespectful or neglectful of the other issues, but the focus of this committee is on the housing. And the, the particular question that Deputy O'Brien and Deputy Ryan referred to, I think if you'd like to try and address those, please. Yeah, I, we, we didn't... Um refer specifically to the recommendations that followed uh, Roy's one, but uh, perhaps before I come to those and, and trying to address the particular issue that's been raised, um, when I referred to a two-tier system at the beginning, um, it was the difference between people in direct provision and people in emergency reception and orientation centres. The difference with those asylum seekers who are being brought to the emergency reception and orientation centres is that when they get their papers, they are found housing. They are not just given their papers and left to go on their own way. Recommendation number seven on the final page of this document is to provide people leaving direct provision with proper support for a minimum period of three months, including housing support workers as required. We know from people that have worked with people coming out of prison, people coming out of homelessness or other institutional environments, it makes a huge difference to have someone help you navigate through the system. Go to appointments with landlords, help you to put the documents together. It's, it's a huge step that someone can make but makes quite a, a big difference to somebody, a real practical difference. And it helps to bridge a little bit of the, the, the hierarchy that's developing between a group who we deem possibly to be more in need of protection or more deserving of protection and those who don't, regardless of whether they happen to be the same nationality. So I think that's one. And the, the point you make, Deputy O'Brien, about some in Clendalkin are getting social welfare. If, if you, if certainly if those people have got protection, as in refugee status or subsidiary protection, the Act actually says social welfare, not the reduced amount. So we know there's a huge issue over the legality of the decision to only reduce their payments to the 1910. But I think it's because it's not uniform across the country that people can access A, social welfare, and B, the full social welfare, to enable them to build up a bit of capital in order to afford, even if you've got to wait for social housing, and it's a huge wait, uh, and we're not arguing that this group should jump a queue, it's just having equal access, even to the private rented market. So being able to have, and forgive me if it's again outside, slightly outside the room, but that really helps people to be able to get on their feet in whatever housing exists. And therefore, therefore as I said, to perhaps compete on a more equal footing with those uh, ignoring the additional disadvantages that they have. Um, but yes, take on board that, that come back and um, you'll have to forgive us for putting some things on record, uh, even if it's not for, within the full remit of, the, of this committee. But it does concern us that um, when you're talking about accommodation, when you're talking about housing, it doesn't really make sense to divide it up. We shouldn't. There are particular needs of certain communities, and I know you've got Pavi Point coming in and an organisation that works with people um, who are coming off or on drugs, but it's a, there are particular needs of communities, but in a sense, they're very basic needs that people have. We, I was out uh, on, in front of Central Bank on Saturday. We were running a uh, a refugee rights kind of desk and we're inviting people to come up and leave a message of solidarity. Some of those we met were homeless. One guy actually turned up with his sleeping bag and he just left a message to say to refugees, say, stay strong, out of recognition that there isn't necessarily a distinction. Um, but I, t I take your point that we, we will come, you know, put, put something very briefly to address more particularly something that come from this committee. But I hope those two recommendations might be of some benefit. I don't know if you have anything to add. Um, just to start involving the local communities in the integration process when people move out of direct provision so that they can move on and to provide support services when people are making the transition to negotiate social welfare, access to housing, that's become one of the big blocks that people have, and to allow those granted refugee status, to their subsidy protection relief to remain, access to social welfare while in direct provision, as Sue has mentioned, that they can start building up some capital so that they have the ability to move on. 
um, and to for the Department of Social Welfare to provide information to people when they do receive their papers or from RIA when they receive their papers, how to negotiate the systems and structures that are in place that are impeding them to access housing. Um, all these would be hugely beneficial and make a difference. If, if you've been in accommodation where it's full board and lodging, literally, the bedding and everything, and even if you're moving into rented accommodation, you don't have the basic things, and you're having to start with the towels and the duvets and the sheets. All of these things add up, and it means you know, you're struggling to even get those together. Um, and so that access to that initial funding or some assistance to do with that for this particular group. But somebody who can... What the, the, a ta there was a task force set up in response to the working group and the protection process last year, which produced a document which has got useful information in about citizens' information, money advice bureau, etc. But information by itself, unless it's it's tangible in some in someone to help you access that, doesn't necessarily um, mean very much. So that that point about somebody being put in place. Um, I mean, in the past, in other countries, they've had groups that to whom uh, something, the equivalent of the reception integration agency could say, okay, this is the group you now need to go to, and they'll be the ones that tell you about access to social welfare, will help you access it, will help you navigate the housing market, and just that bit of assistance can make a huge difference, and it means, you, you know, okay, you're still joining a queue of 20 who are looking at private accommodation, but at least you're joining a queue rather than floundering about, about where to even find the accommodation. Thank you. Deputy Brazel. Yeah, um, thank you for your uh, report. I just would have a few um, maybe questions from my own uh, knowledge and information. <coughs> Numbers-wise, is it increasing, decreasing, or remaining, remaining steady? And, and given the, the crisis that is in the Mediterranean at the moment, how is that affecting people uh, coming here, wanting to come here, or trying to get here by whatever means or measures they do? Um, the, the issue around 500 people who have who are in direct provision centres but are, are qualified to, to move out, that's very concerning in that um, you would think that after spending so long in, in a direct provision service that a person would literally do anything. And, you made the point that you know getting off the ground is, is very difficult. It's very difficult for anybody. Um, in in you know just working with people at a local authority level, from which is my background, I would have helped many people who would have you know got local authority housing. The, the local welfare office does provide assistance, and the local council does provide assistance to people getting started with regard to you know cooking equipment, bedding, that type of thing. Is that not available to, uh, is the same service not available to, to uh, uh, refugees who, who's got his papers? It, it's not so much that it's not available, because I'm sure local authorities would make that available without discrimination or distinction. It's that people do not know. It's, you are literally given, I think it may be referred to in the document that we've produced, a, a letter that says, Right, you've got your papers and technically 21 days to move on, but Reception Integration Agency allows people to stay longer because they recognise the difficulties that people are in. But that's not, it, it's that gap. It's the gap between even that euphoria and, you know, finally, finally you've got something and what? It's, it's, it's almost, people that are in the system have said, we're in Ireland, but we're not our, our Ireland. And if they're not integrated from the beginning, then what they need when they leave is almost like a welcome to Ireland pack for the very first time, which would point them in the direction of the existing services. But maybe the local authorities themselves could be a bit more proactive if they know that they've got these direct provision centres um, in their locality. Okay. But in, just in terms of numbers, if you want me to address that, it is increasing. Um, we, we, 2013, 2014, the numbers actually arriving and claiming asylum reduced to about uh, under 1,000. And then it started to grow um, um, 2014, 2015, and 2015 figures were about 3,500 sought asylum in Ireland. And then, of course, um, on two occasions last year, the government here entered into commitments to take an initial group from Lebanon and Jordan and Greece and Italy and then increase that. So the commitment is 4,000 over two years, although that's moving very slowly. Um, the, the, so the numbers are going up, but because of Ireland's geographical location, and the difficulty of getting here, and of course, as we know now, the borders have gone up and 50,000 are stuck in Greece. 
Um, we're not seeing as many that could even make their way of their own volition, although um, there are uh, officers assisting the RIC authorities there to determine applications, and uh, officers of the Department of Justice go into countries such as Greece and Italy to try and identify people who could be located here. But the numbers have, will pro I would suspect they'll stabilise from this point onwards because of the difficulties in travelling. But they did go up quite significantly, but nowhere near what they were at the, the peak of 11,500 in 2002, and I wouldn't expect them to go anywhere near that. Thank you. Just, just to complete um, the, um, this recommendation about ability to work, I think that is really the key. Um, I, I think that any, um, all, all uh, refugees and asylum, asylum seekers would have had quite a lot to offer society and should be given the opportunity um, and uh, whether we like it or not there's a, a sort of a, a latent begrudgery out there and you know if people uh, asylum seekers are seen to be provided for and, and they don't really, that's not what they want but that's, that's the, what they're forced into. It just generates, um, you know, something that it's an unfortunate part of our society, but it's there, and, and the, the ability to work would, would greatly alleviate that, and, and I, I'm sure um, the, uh, many of the people would, would, would be very beneficial to Irish society and, and should be given that opportunity. And just the last question I, I'd ask is, is there any country out there that has managed to deal with this issue successfully and has a model of best practice in place that we could look at and follow on and, and, and adopt because it just, it, you know, I, it, it seems to be this, I, you know, it seems to be a crisis everywhere. Uh, but is there some is is there any uh, shining example out there of of, of a, a government or a country that has done things right in this regard that we could we could we could um, there is one. just just one thank uh, if you bear with me one moment deputy harty wanted to come in and two deputies wanted to comment who were in already and then I'll, I'll i'll come back to you because they wanted to comment on other issues that so deputy harty if you don't yeah, just two two short questions um when residents go into direct provision and the emergency reception and orientation centres, are they officially deemed to be homeless at that stage? Or wh when do they become homeless? Is it when they, they, they leave those centres? And secondly, um, in relation to integration, is, is there no system of integration the moment people arrive in the, in the um, reception centres or the uh, emergency uh, orientation centre? Is integration not a part of their assimilation? And the two fur further points, Deputy O'Brien, you. Sorry, just, just two points to kind of add to John's. I mean, one of the problems, for example, is there's a requirement when you're applying for social housing, if you're from outside of Ireland, that you have to provide documentation to prove that you don't own property in another country. Uh, and obviously, if you fled a country from war or whatever, providing that documentation is almost impossible. Some local authorities will accept an affidavit, but an affidavit can cost between 20 and 50 euros. And if you're only getting 19 euros 50 a week, that's a huge barrier. Just it's one small thing. But and the other thing is, and maybe this is something uh, again you could comment on. The all of the local authorities do provide exactly the same advice and information service to anybody who goes in, but not everybody who goes in has the same ability to understand that. In that, that advice and information. So if you've grown up here, you understand what the revenue is and you understand what a PPS number is and you know, whereas if you've been trapped in direct provision for say eight years and you're now out officially, understanding all of that takes far more than just the standard information and advice that good quality local authority clerks will provide, um, which is why I presume the argument is, and I'm wondering, this is my question, do you think there's a need for advocacy organisations to provide that additional support? Do you think it should be provided within the existing statutory agencies, or do you have a preference? Okay. And Deputy Wallace. Yeah, um, but, uh, my questions are, I'm, I'm probably cheating a little bit, a little bit off the, the subject, uh, but given that uh, you have a very good understanding of uh, the issues, um, first, um, do you see any way around, um, is there any way, do you think the Irish government could look at the idea of screening uh, unaccompanied minors in camps like Calais and Dunkirk? And my second question, uh, 
with the EU policy uh, now, with the Greek-Turkey deal, uh, a situation where really only Syrians are being entertained. Uh, Whoever has been pushed back from Greece uh, have been replaced by um, um, uh, Syrians that haven't come over already. Uh, do you, what can be done about, for example, people from, like the Kurds and the Iraqis, not the Iraqis, but the, the Kurds from Iraq and the Afghanistans, where uh, the country has uh, absolutely uh, collapsed and is divided up between the Taliban and ISIS at the moment. I mean, the notion that the EU is going to say no to the Kurds and to the Afghans, uh, how can we, is there any way that that can be challenged or addressed? Thank you, Deputy. Uh, some of those, Ms. Ganlon, were general questions, and you might want to refer to them, and some of them were specific about the 